sure everything. I lived in Massachusetts, which is in the northeast part of the United States, and we lived across the street from the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. So I grew up on the ocean. It had a big influence on me. I was very fortunate to, to be able to live like that. You know, where you had a beach in the summer, you know, and you had uh, just had the ocean with the, the waves and the the storms and the, the nice beach and so I was very happy. Well my first relationship with wood was in my father's workshop. He would make things out of wood and so it was natural for me to play with all of the pieces of wood he had left over. When you walked into his shop you could smell the wood Oh, it smells so good. And then he would give me scraps of wood to play with, you know, to make something with. Use a hammer. So that's, that's my first contact, very first contact with wood. Uh, when I took this adult education class, which was in a workshop at a high school, to make furniture for my little boys, I saw a lathe against the wall, several, nobody was using. So my first contact with wood turning was not at a, at a, uh, a meeting with wood turners, it was at the school. And I asked the teacher, I said, can we use those? And he said, yes, you can, but I don't know how to teach you. <laughs> so, so, I, I knew what to do, but I was doing it all by myself. Of course, uh, I'll show you a piece of furniture I made with no instructions, just me. And, but I, I have this, this idea that if you want to learn something, you can, you can learn by yourself. You know, you have to do some reading, you have to practice, practice, practice. The first organized meeting was when Albert Leikoff had his wood turning symposiums in Philadelphia about 1980. And I met people, I could not believe what they were doing. Uh, I met Bob Stocksdale, I met older what they call elder state, statesmen who have been doing wood turning all their lives and they make a living of it. I met teachers who taught wood turning. I met other people like me that were just beginning to learn. I met Dale Nish. I met all these wonderful people. I didn't know who they were, but they were the most important people in the world at, at that time about wood turning. And so it was just a weekend like in Tampa, but it was just, Amazing. I just walked away from there and I knew what I wanted to do. And I could see that I needed to learn more skills and more techniques. So that was the first part of wood turning is to meet people that could do things better than you could and then learn from that. So that's, that's my first encounter in 1980. I went back again. He did one more in 1981. And I met other people like David Ellsworth and uh, Mike Hoselock and uh, just all kinds of wonderful wood turners. And then eventually the AAW uh, began their symposiums in nine, uh, about six years later. And so I started attending those every year. So I've attended 26 out of the 27 symposiums. When I first started wood turning, 
uh, there were many there weren't many wood turning books available but I found out my the most important books that I read that had the most influence on me were books that had nothing to do with wood turning one of them was how to see how to look at things like a photographer does you know he can see something that most people don't uh, look at or they overlook and the other one is the other book that was important to me was uh, workmanship how you have to be as good as you possibly can be you cannot do work that doesn't look right it has has to be it has to be good and those two books are nothing to do with wood turning but they have everything to do with wood turning to me What you have to learn is techniques on how to make things. And so uh, you try different things. You make a bowl, you make a leg, you, you do those sorts of things and you can become very good at that. But then you say to yourself, I need to do something else. So uh, I did pens, I did a miniature goblets that you saw, the little tiny goblets. Um, I did bowls. Uh, I wasn't, nothing impressed me. You know, I said, okay, I'm good at this. I can do this. But now, do I want to do this more? So I wanted to keep doing different things. Then there was a symposium where I saw people who did hollow forms. And that's something I had never done before. So I, I wanted to do, wanted to try that. And it was a, a long learning process because it's difficult to do. There were no tools available like there are now. So I had to make my own tools. And that, but because I had an engineering background, that was not a problem for me. So I made my own tools and I started doing hollow forms and then I said, this is what I really like to do. So that's, and it's, it's still there, okay? And I might be questioning that now. Maybe I should be doing something else. And I'm thinking about that, but right now it's what I like to do. So everything you see is based on a hollow form. I like the idea of a hollow form because it relates to all cultures have vessels. Uh, whether they're a bowl or a clothes vessel or a vase, There's every culture you can think of, um, even ancient cultures will have a hollow form. So it's a part of humanity. This is uh, an object that everybody has. And then from there, people will decorate them based on their culture. And so that's, uh, that's the beginning of a, a new journey, is when you can look at what people do and how they express their culture and, uh, in their work is, is where I'm at now, actually. Think of other cultures and how they design their, their, their vessels, it's telling a story about themselves or what's important to them. So I think that's a good thing to do. It's telling people a story about you and what's important to you and, and what makes you who you are. You know? So waves, if I live on a beach, waves are part of my growing up. And there are other things that mimic um, some part of nature, not a big picture but a small picture other things too is I love patterns okay and patterns can come from architecture come from nature come from everywhere you just have to look for them I grew where I grew up there was a is a very famous museum called the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem Massachusetts and the museum collected artwork from Asia when 
America was brand new, 1700 something, and they sailed all over the world and, and the sea captains collected these beautiful pieces and brought them home. And they now now in the museum. So when I was growing up, I saw all of these artifacts from Asia. And very interesting, very different, but very interesting. And so that kind of goes inside of you somehow. I don't know how to explain it. It becomes part of you that you, you have an interest. So I saw a book there on Chinese lattice patterns. And patterns, I love patterns, so I bought the book before I was doing any wood turning. I just bought the book because I liked the patterns. And then one day I said, you know, while I was doing this carving and, and embellishing on pieces, I said, I'd love to do some of these patterns and see what they look like. Just curious. I'm, I wonder, what does it look like when you do, take something that's two-dimensional and make it three-dimensional? What happens? And that's how it happened. It's very simple. <laughs> Not difficult. <laughs> okay, well this piece is a hollow form that has a pattern superimposed on it all the way around. It was derived from a Chinese lattice pattern. I'm going to leave the lines there so that this thing will just show the structure of the pattern. And the problem is that it's easy where the pattern is big, but the pattern converges near the top into smaller and smaller segments. So it gets to the point where the pattern becomes very small and it takes a lot more work to do the small ones as it does the big ones. And it will generate some smoke, have go out the door. Stop. Once it's all done, then you can sand off all of the ink and get it all clean and then put a finish on it. It's very strong. Very strong. Then I made the usual things like bowls and I got into hollow forms and what I was doing is just presenting the beauty of the wood. I wasn't doing anything that was part of me into the piece until later. And then I decided that it's another form of expression. In other words, people can write, people can dance, people can sing. They're using their, another form of expressing themselves rather than just talking. And so I felt that that was the way to go, is to use what I make to tell people about me, about what I like, what's important to me, and that's where I am today, still doing that. See, it's, it's working with your hands mm -hmm. is, is what my family did. His father was a farmer, worked with his hands. He was, he was not a, my father was not a farmer, but he always worked with his hands. It was not a problem to go to college to get an education, but still have this idea that working with your hands is good. You know, it's good because uh, it helps round you out as a person. Always part of working is thinking about other things to do. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of times it's you come up with an idea, you write it down because it is fleeting. It will go away very quickly if you don't write it down and you think about it. And you think, always looking, always looking at things. Uh, if I go to a gallery, I'll look at things. I mean, you have to look at things. You have to keep seeing. Uh, that's, I, don't, I can't see how you can make things without seeing what's around you and that, uh, what influences you too, to, to do what you want to do. So I don't, ha I don't have any 
specific future plans other than just keeping active and keeping alert about seeing things. You know.